OK, is nuclear the answer? And the government would say the policy to which they, they are trying to address that question is the energy trilemma. It's the three-cornered, three as they see it, uh, uh, policy problem of meeting the need for affordable energy, affordable for you and me and affordable for business so that our economy keeps going, affordable, um, uh, uh, sorry, in terms of a secure supply for, for the country, uh, and also in terms of being sustainable in terms of our long-term and even short-term carbon emission goals. And I'd add on to that that there are two other things that are bearing down on, on, these que on this question. The first is, a it first is a matter of urgency. It's urgent in terms of our carbon emissions. Uh, as most of you would know, we've really got the, the next 10 years to decide whether we, decide whether we do stay under two degrees or not. What we do now is, is incredibly important. Um, and we also have a looming uh, energy possible problem, immediate problem, or immediate dilemma in terms of our supply because we have so many power stations going offline. We also face the slightly longer term issue, when I say longer term, I'm only talking 10 years away, um, of needing to expand our electricity supply to meet the needs of a decarbonised heating and decarbonised transport. I'll come on and explain all that a lot more, but, um, but this, is the, this, is, this is the framework that the government is trying to address and that I hope that we'll tackle this evening. Um, just, um, just so that you understand where we are with nuclear at the moment, um, as we discussed last week, we're making phenomenal movements in our energy consumption. This is just electricity, which is only about a fifth of our primary energy consumption, but it's very, very crucial um, because it has the potential to be clean. Um, and as you will see, we have just in one year moved from renewables of uh, just over 19% to almost 25%, and 2016 will show a much, much further movement on from there. Coal down from 30 to 22%, and again, 2016 will show a phenomenal movement from there because we have closed uh, down so many of our um, coal-fired power stations this year. But nuclear and gas, you will see, are very much staying as they are. Very, very much steady. Um, and so it, at the moment, we can say that renewables are pretty much keeping pace with our closure of power stations, but we're not making inroads into gas and nuclear, and we're not building in enough extra energy supply to meet those extra decarbonised needs of heating and transport. So that's where we are. Now, what I'm going to do in this lecture is the first half is a rather geeky look at... Um, I hope you'll, you, you'll see the point of it. It is uh, a look at how the, how, what nuclear power is. So it's, for me, it's into answering all those questions, all those things that I've grown up with, and I'm sure you have too. Uranium, plutonium, enrichment, uh, uh, refueling, and all the rest of it. And it's just, I'm gonna walk you through kind of the process so that you can understand uh, and perhaps provide a better answer um, towards that, that question of whether nuclear really is cheap uh, and clean um, and safe is uh, another factor. So we're going to uh, do that. In the second half, we will take a short break at that point, um, and there'll be room for any questions there. In the second half, we will look at where we are with government policy now, and if, let's say, we'll take another quick breather, and then we will round it up and look at uh, 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 policy going forward and answer those questions about whether it is clean and affordable and secure. OK, so if anybody hasn't discovered Gridwatch, here we are. Um, this just uh, builds on what, what I was saying a minute ago about where we are with nuclear production. Um, and this was um, actually a clip from Gridwatch taken during the summer where we were pretty much offline with coal. For the first time since the 1880s, our country was coal-free for about around 200 hours, which is pretty extraordinary. But you will see there, during the summer months, admittedly of a much smaller consumption, only 25 gigawatts, um, but nuclear was around a third of our consumption. So it's still a phenomenal amount that, uh, that we are dependent upon. And these are our interconnectors. These are the, the lines that uh, are, um, which we've been forced uh, by the EU, uh, although I'm sure we wanted to too. Um, uh, we have uh, built connections to various other countries in Europe, to Ireland mainly, but, and to the North, and North Europe 
uh, wind farms and to France. And I, the reason I've put that on is because the French interconnector is also very much nuclear, of course. Now, there's a question here that I can't really answer, and maybe some of you who have more knowledge of uh, grid balancing can answer for me. Um, one of the extraordinary things is that Gridwatch tells us is that it, we, we do import around 5% of our electricity, and a lot of it comes from France. In fact, most of that comes from France. But we actually import from France during the summer months when we are not actually short of electricity. In fact, this summer, some of our electricity prices went negative um, because we had an oversupply, which is quite extraordinary. But we seem to export to France during the winter months. Now, if anyone can explain that to me during the break, I'd be really, really grateful because it doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, really, I'm just emphasising nuclear is a big part of our power production at the moment. So, the story of nuclear. This is where it started, plutonium, and that's what we wanted, of course, after the Second World War and in the Cold War. We wanted it for our weapon systems. Um, and uh, although there is some plutonium you can find naturally uh, around the planet, um, generally it's a byproduct of fission, um, and that's what we wanted. We could, there are actually two radioactive substances which we could have gone for, which are in large uh, quantities around the, the world. Uranium, one of them. Thorium was the other. Um, and uh, in fact, thorium is more abundant and does well in reactors, apparently. But there were various reasons why we didn't go for that, partly because it's particularly dangerous and difficult to handle and process, but also because it uh, ma maximises the destruction of plutonium, and we wanted the plutonium for our weapons. So we didn't go for thorium. We'll come back to thorium because it's now being looked at as a, a potential source now. Um, we went with uranium, named after Uranus, which was discovered, I think, in 1781. Um, and if, like me, you've grown up with the knowledge of a 235 and a 238 uh, and not known quite what they are, that's what they are. They are isotopes within the uranium. And the point is that the 238, which is the vast majority, over 90%, is not fissile. You can't split it. The bit that, that we've been interested in is the 0.7%, which you can split. Um, and because it's such a small proportion to use in our reactors, what we need to do is enrich it. We need to up that content by another few percent to make it worth using. Fun fact, we do actually have a, a uranium mine in this country, although it's uh, now defunct. Um, there's a chap called Mark Thomas, and uh, if you go onto YouTube, you can follow him wandering around uh, this area in Cornwall in his car with a Geiger counter, and it's actually quite frightening. But this was a, a mine, it was the only one that was mined particularly for uranium, um, and it's for Marie Curie's um, research. Um, but the question is now, of course, when you think about the security of supply and so on, who's got uranium? Um, and you can see a, a list there of Australia at the top. In fact, it's not just who's got uranium that's crucial here, it's the, it's the uh, concentrations of uranium. And in fact, Canada has by far the highest concentration and they are the major, major producers. Their, their uranium is about 20% of the rock, which means you know, you've got to throw away 80% of it to get 20% useful stuff. But that compares very favourably with, uh, say, Namibia, which is about 100 parts per million, so 0.01%. So, um, 0.1%? Yes, so very, very low in concentration. And again, we'll come back to that right at the end, because the concentration has a big impact on price and a big impact on the security supply and so on going forward. So, um, so just bear that in mind. But there are different ways of getting uh, Uranium. This is the mine in Namibia, open cast mining. Bit of a disaster because you need water, of course, to dampen down the radon gases. Namibia doesn't have too much of that. And now there are, of course, a lot of reports of, of cancers and so on um, to do with that. You can deep mine it, but uh, you've got a confined space with a lot of radon gas. Most now comes from, or a large proportion comes from, what they call leaching. Either this is heap leaching. Now this doesn't make sense to me, but um, but I'm, it obviously does. You on plastic mats, I'm told, you heap up the uranium, you spray it with acid for one to three months until you get the uranium out of it, um, and it floats down into this pond, and then you separate the uranium. That this is in New Mexico. This one's in Wyoming. Or you can pump acid down through the water table in a well uh, into that the rock into the uranium bearing rock turn that rock into a sort of sludge and then pump it back up again through the 
the, uh, the water table and out. And you'll see there, of course, there's, there's a, a radon leak when that happens, or radon uh, evaporation uh, pond. But anyway, that's how we get it. And what we get is yellow cake. And this needs a lot of drying and crushing. Um, and in fact, that, uh, this is a calcinum that you have to dry that cake, at, uh, that uh, uranium, at about 800 degrees um, uh, for quite a long time. And so it's quite an energy intensive process. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Getting uranium isn't easy uh, and there's a lot of energy involved in it. Um, we then transport it to, the, it to wherever, to this country. It's a fairly inert material at this stage, so it doesn't need special containers, but it does have special ships. Um, the World uh, Nuclear Authority say that, um, although there have been various accidents, no uranium has ever actually been, you know, there's never been a, a catastrophic spill. And in fact, they complain about over-regulation, so there we go. But here is, in this country, it comes into Ellesmere Port near Liverpool. And I don't know if you can just see from down there, just sort of slightly down, there's Capenhurst. And that's where it's transported to, to our um, enrichment plant. So we need to get that 0.7% enriched up uh, by a few percentage points before we can turn it into fuel. Again, look, I mean, you can't really see statistics on this, but I mean, just looking at the pictures, you can see that this is quite an energy intensive process. It looks to me, and again, if anybody has information on it, I'd be grateful. Those towers there look to me like, a, 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 like either gas or coal generating uh, uh, facilities. And you can see all the power lines around and so on. So again, it's quite, a, quite an intensive process. We enrich either through centrifugal process where you spin out the atoms so that they um, uh, they go out by weight and you can take the ones that you want or by gaseous um, diffusion and gaseous diffusion is um, or enrichment shall I say is a much much more intensive um, energy intensive process anyway one way or another we end up with enriched uranium um, in fact, at Capenhurst, we were doing much more than that. We were actually enriching to 90% for our weapons programme, first of all. Um, um, but we now use uh, plutonium from Sellafield for, for our weapons. Um, and that, the, the uh, centre now for the highly enriched uranium is, is left under care and surveillance. Uh, depleted uranium, so you've taken all this 235 out of some uranium to enrich the other stuff. The stuff that is depleted, we also use in our weaponry. We use it for uh, armour plating uh, of uh, tanks and so on, and some uh, medical uses. And Capenhurst is the storage site for that depleted uranium till at least 2120. So very much you can see that the links between our, um, our two processes, the weapons and the and, um, civil nuclear power. Uh, in fact, at this, uh, in the early stages, it was all about weaponry. Um, so the fuel goes from Cape and Hurst up to um, Springfields uh, near Preston, at where it's made into fuel rods to be then distributed around to the various reactors around the country. Um, and again, an in energy intensive process around 3000 degrees to produce the graphite to, uh, which will act as a moderator to control the reactions in the, in the reactors. And at the moment that fuel manufactures to, to continue till 2023, but I wonder if that's a movable date because we have put back the dates of our, um, of our current nuclear program. So, our first nuclear power plant was opened in 1956, and here's the Queen uh, doing so. I and mean, it's really quite—I mean, when you think that's about 13 years before we went to the moon, that really—I you know, mean, when I look at that car, it makes me think about, gosh, how old all this was when we started it, and with very little planning, really. Um, it seems to me for for what happened to the waste uh, and how it all, would all work out in the end. And we went on and built another 26 or 26 uh, Magnox reactors uh, in total. Now, just for clarity, I should say that these reactors, basically what we wanted was, what we decided was that by d uh, putting together a civil uh, electricity program, civil reactors, um, we would kill two birds with one stone. We would get the plutonium for the weapons um, while producing civil power. So it, it, it fulfilled two, two roles there. But the, um, and in fact, just for clarity, just the Magnox reactors did, don't need the enrichment, so they would have bypassed the Capenhurst um, section of things. They would, uh, their stuff would have come straight from Springfields. 
And it, basically what happens, it's a very simple system once you're in the reactor, well, relatively simple. Um, these are gas-cooled reactors. CO2 is pumped in here. Around the, the rods where the reaction is happening, which are incredibly hot, um, the gas heats up and it's pumped out. The graphite rods are used to control the reaction. So if we need it hotter, the graphite rods are taken up. If we need to speed up the reaction, and they're put down when they slow down the reaction. And the gas comes out the top. Then we've, we've got water pumped in through this system, and the gas, there's a heat exchange between the hot gas and the water. We pop, pop out the hot water, and that goes off to make um, uh, steam and turn turbines, as per usual in, any, in most of our electricity production. Uh, and in fact, actually, this, uh, there's a chap called Peter Joseph on the internet, if you uh, see, if you can look him up. And he, does, he actually gets inside Albury uh, reactor, uh, Albury um, power station, and, uh, and does a good view of this. And this is one of his pictures. So it's just to show you, there are the reactors, and then there are underground pipes bringing the steam to the, to the turbine hall. And that's a, that's a fuel rod. The fins there are to help the gas circulate. And there we are, there's the Queen opening Calder Hall. And these would have been stacked about sort of eight on top of each other in the floor. So there we are. But we moved on after the Magnox. So we had 26 Magnox uh, reactors. And the last one closed um, December last year, Wilfa in um, uh, Anglesey, on the Isle of Anglesey. But we moved on onto gas cooled reactors. Uh, an attempt to improve on the design. These do use enriched uranium, so the uranium has to come through Capenhurst before it goes to Springfield and then out to the different, uh, different uh, reactors. Um, and this is a bit of a, a disastrous design in many ways. I'll, I'll come on to that. But um, certainly uh, one of the questions now, we still all have all our uh, gas cooled reactors in operation and one of the queries is about the graphite loss um, and whether basically we've extended the life of these uh, reactors to, to keep them open longer than they were originally scheduled to be um, and one of the questions there is about how safe they are at the moment with their, their graphite loss which depletes over years. So we have seven twin sites uh, for gas-cooled reactors, um, and these are the sites, these, these have all been given extensions now till to, to most of them were supposed to, some of them were supposed to have closed down in 2014, um, and they've all been given 10-year extensions. Sizewell B is the odd one out, and that's been extended till 2035, and that is the odd one out also in that it's a, a pressure, pressurised water reactor, reactor, an American design, uh, and here it is, and I've put that there just to, just to show one of the potential problems that people see is that, that they've all been located close to the, to the coast, um, mainly for safety reasons, so that they were in areas where there was a, less of a population. But of course, with rising sea levels and so on, there is um, a very much a question about, you know, sort of slow shelving beaches and, and how, uh, how much they can be protected. And just to clarify, of course, the cooling water we use at seawater to condense that steam and that goes straight back out into the sea so we are though we are sort of um, putting hot water straight back into the sea it's not radioactive water it's not coming to contact into contact with the uranium but um, but it is hot water and when you think about the issues about our warming seas and so on uh, it's an added added factor so there we are our AGRs have all been extended um, uh, really because we we, we don't have enough supply at the moment um, but and but that doesn't make them a reliable supply at the end of 2014 um, we've certainly had problems with um, boilers being defective cracks in boilers and so on and, that, and several of them having to be closed down so the longer we keep these aged nuclear plants open we can't necessarily rely on them to to be there um, or to be there safely for us that's a map of our sites and you may see there that there are so the yellow dots are where there are fueling sites to do it. That's Capenhurst, Sellafield, um, uh, and um, Springfield. But we also have some research sites on there. So just so you're aware, these are names that you've probably heard over the years. Dune Ray, um, where we did a lot of research into diff a different kind of reactor, the fast breeder reactor, which um, didn't work. It was um, plutonium fueled and generated more plutonium. Um, 
and the um, that that has become an absolute byword for disasters in the nuclear industry. They, um, they were disposing of their waste uh, and stuff down this shaft on the left-hand side without any care for what was going in. There was an explosion. And now it is left with a, a really sort of damning safety situation. Very hard to retrieve the stuff safely, very hard to get it out uh, and so on. But that has started to happen. A clear up started in 2008 um, and they're building a new plant to retrieve the waste, uh, sending it to Sellafield. <coughs> Even the US is taking some of the stuff to make it safe, apparently, uh, and send it back to Europe as medical stuff later on, is the, is the plot. Um, but it really is, I mean, the, the Scots have apparently given up on trying to make this a safe or clean beach. It won't be clean for at least a couple of hundred years. So it's pretty much a, a disaster site. We have Winthrop in Dorset, um, another um, research centre. And we have Harwell, which again was very much involved with, um, I think, nuclear um, weaponry uh, research as well as civil, the civil programme. Uh, and that's now been closed. But this year, in 2006, in May, we opened the Cullum Science Centre, which is a, obviously a part private, part public, publicly funded centre. It's listed on our, as a, at one of our research, nuclear research centres. Um, and it's interesting. First, thing, first page that comes up when you look at this is it's all about weaponry. Um, so it's BAE systems uh, and so on. So it's very much a public-private partnership there, which of course we are partly funding. But all roads lead back to Sellafield, of course, and Sellafield you will definitely have heard of, and it has various functions. And um, again, just to note, just from the pictures, again, it looks to me like Sellafield has its own generation source of power, which obviously is nothing to do with the grid. It'll, be, um, it'll have its own secure set, uh, generation, either presumably gas or coal. But if anybody's got any information on that, I'd be quite interested to hear. Um, the fuel gets to Sellafield from our spent fuel is taken from our reactors all over the country on a regular basis. I'm told that trains go through Bristol about four times a, a week. Um, and, of course, down in uh, Somerset, there's road transport from Hinkley as well before it's loaded onto the trains and then it comes, comes up. So at Sellafield, there are various things that happen. So we have the, we have the original nuclear site of um, Calder Hall, which you saw the Queen opening, and there was a prototype before that, wind scale piles, um, which didn't last long, and we'll come on to that in a second. It's also the reprocessing site. It takes the spent fuel from our current Magnot plants, or the, the ones that, that finally finished producing at the end of last year. And then there's Thorpe, which takes from the current AGRs, from the current uh, gas-cooled reactors. And it also takes foreign waste uh, on a commercial uh, basis uh, and reprocesses it and hopefully sends it back. Um, and it's the storage of all waste from, from all our our sites. But it didn't start well. Um, with that first prototype uh, reactor, there was the wind scale fire, which was our biggest nuclear accident in this country. Um, in fact, apparently it was Churchill who um, was very keen that we got that plutonium before there was a test ban, before we were forbidden to start developing our nuclear weapons. So in order to move quickly, they, um, they slowed down the cooling and that's what caused the fire. <coughs> so various members of staff did, um, did uh, uh, back out, did, did uh, resign over it before the fire, and then there was the fire. So it was, it was a huge disaster. Um, so, but the main other uh, part, uh, so we have, the, we have Calderdale, which, Calder Hall, which is now closed, the uh, reprocessing from the Magnox plants, um, and then there is the reprocessing from the AGRs, and that's Thorpe. So that's taking the, um, the rods from, from the reactors that are operating at the moment and from abroad. And here they are coming in uh, into Sellafield. And basically the process is that they are chopped and dissolved in nitric <coughs> acid. Um, the waste is separated uh, and stored. And then the fuel is... Um, and the plutonium can be turned into what they call a mixed oxide fuel. But in fact, we can't use that in our country. With our uh, gas-cooled reactors, that we don't use that fuel. Only size well B could use it, but it doesn't. Um, it's not particularly economic if the uranium price is low. 
Um, and the waste products, the, um, the fission products uh, and the, what they call the transuranics, which are highly, highly radioactive and highly dangerous, are vitrified and they are turned into glass and they are stored on the site at Sellafield. Now, what I'm trying to get you to, to realise with this is that I just want you to bear in mind that issue about is nuclear cheap, is it clean, is it secure? So keep those questions in your mind as, as, as I'm going through this. And of course, anybody who saw Panorama a month or two ago, and I hope you have, and if you haven't, please see it on, on, um, on the iPlayer, um, will, you will have seen what a disaster Sellafield is. And I think, again, that's, that's such a worrying thing when you think about the fact that we're looking at expanding our nuclear programme. It's just been a sort of litany of mismanagement so far. Um, and even now, um, you know, I mean, things they found out were that the staffing levels are routinely too low, routinely below minimum standards. This is such a sensitive site. Um, they've had 97 incidents in, in one year. Alarms are going off all over the place. The staff are just ignoring them, uh, you know, because there are too many to react to. Radioactive materials stored in plastic bottles, dry uh, silos corroding. I think perhaps this is the, the, the biggest risk at the moment, is that these leaky concrete ponds, if they, if they uh, stop cooling what's in them, then there is a big risk of a fire. Um, so that is, that is the, the, the risk. I mean, it's just a litany of disaster. And the head of nuclear safety there, I mean, I, he, his words sort of ring in my ears. They're putting right some underinvestments of the past. You know, it just doesn't even begin to, uh, to deal with the mess that is Sellafield. Um, and, it, and it has cost us quite a bit of money. Uh, I mean, over the years, the, um, just, just most recently, the management of all this was handed to an American uh, company that's featured, on, in fact, on Panorama, uh, M NMP. Um, and they've now been stripped of their, um, their contract. But, um, you know, just the usual disasters, but awarding themselves performance fees when they're very much not on track with their program. Um, when, they, when they were stripped of their contract, we still had to pay almost, um, you know, well, 430 million in a termination fee uh, and so on. We're looking at, you know, 110 billion over the next uh, foreseeable future to deal with the waste that we have now from our nuclear plants, okay? And actually, to be honest, that figure is, I should imagine, it seems to me just plucked from the sky, 110 billion, but uh, you'll see as we go on, the rate that that figure's been going up makes it, you know, really, it's a blank check. As they said on the Panorama programme, it's a blank check. We do not know where this is going to end. We, did, we, ha we do send some uh, high-level waste back to the countries that, that, uh, it's, uh, that we've taken in from, so we, we do it on a commercial basis. It's been a big yen earner for us in particular. There have been issues about falsification of safety data as we've sent stuff back to, to foreign countries, particularly to Japan. Um, so it's just not a pretty, it doesn't come across as a well-regulated industry uh, to anybody looking at it. Um, Beyond all that, we still have all those Magnox sites out there. That, as I say, the last one closed down in, at the end of last year. They're sitting there. So actually, you can see there on the top line, that's the end of generation. Most of them are pretty much defueled now or will be in the very foreseeable future within the next year or two. Then they go into what they call care and maintenance preparations. Care and maintenance, they are left to sit doing nothing for decades. Um, before there is the final site clearance, which won't start till the end of this century. Okay, so that's, we remember we have 26 of these. And I did, I mean, this is just a sort of personal story. I went to see Trusfenith, and I, apologies for my uh, pronunciation to anybody who's from Wales. Um, but this is our only inland one. It's actually on a big reservoir in uh, near Snowdonia. And this one closed down in 1993. And I advise you to go. It's a very beautiful lake uh, and so on. And when you park there, or when I did, uh, maybe I caught it on a bad day, but the air is just humming with electricity. It is buzzing with electricity for hundreds of yards, for a wide, wide distance around this plant. This is, you know, the car park is absolutely full. It is teeming with people. This is a very, very alive site. This is 23 years after it closed. Now, my only point here is really, it's about as ever, when you're looking at whether a, a, 
a power producer is clean or cost-effective. It always depends on how you do the accounting. And my concern is how much of this is added in to those calculations? You know, that the, I suspect that the, um, the humming electricity is from diesel generators on site. And, you know, did I just catch it in a bad pack? Well, it looks to me like there is a lot of work going on. What they're aiming now at the moment is to bring these, they're in their care and maintenance preparations, so they will be bringing down these buildings and turning them into this. <coughs> That's the, the process for the next few years. Um, and then before they clear the site, they leave it for a few decades before they go back to do the final uh, site clearance. So, I, uh, you know, it's just a point that, again, it seems to me that this is not... Um, not that electricity is not being probably added into the full total of um, of it's been not being put in as a negative uh, against what Trustfunith has produced over the years. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so we have waste of all different sorts. Um, that high level waste we've dealt with that goes to the cellar field. Intermediate waste will be held on those sites of our nuclear plants and the low level waste, the, um, the lab equipment, the clothes and so on, which is the really high volume stuff, the big bulky stuff, that most of that gets transported to Drig Village in Cumbria, poor old Cumbria. Um, and uh, there we are, it was originally tipped into seven trenches and just capped. But finally, in the late 80s, they got their act together and put it into metal containers, uh, compressed it, put grout in, um, and they've now agreed to extend the vaults there for this. But there are reported, reports of corrosion and cracking, and there was a leak report, leaked report in 2014 saying it is inevitable that there will be radioactive leaks from this, this plant. There is no way we are going to avoid it, and it was a real mistake to uh, locate it so close to the sea. Um, so there we are. That's what we're dealing with from the plants that we ha have closed so far and that we are operating now without going into more. So we still, so that's the Magnot plants. We still got the AGRs to go and size well B. Um, worse when it comes to thinking about the costs and so on, the AGRs really <coughs> have been a disaster um, financially. They took a long time to um, to build and there were many cost runs and overruns and so on they, for decommissioning they will cost about five times the amount of the Magnox plant largely because of the large volume of, of equipment particularly graphite um, there is a small nuclear liabilities fund set up we all pay for it on our electricity bills uh, and so on that money is going towards their decommissioning costs but at the last count uh, 8.65 billion um, and the government of course has pledged to pay the shortfall so that will come to the taxpayers and then the big question, okay, the, the, the big unknown is, okay, all this waste in the end, particularly this high-level waste, what are we going to do with it? And, you know, uh, most of us would think this, this is common sense. Before we get going on a whole new round of nuclear power plants, how come we haven't worked out since the 1950s what to do with the waste we have got? Now, the idea is that there is a geological disposal facility. The idea is that it is going to be safer below ground than it is above ground. And that is probably true. And we probably don't have much choice here. We've got the stuff. We're going to have to do something with it. It is not safe. Um, the only country that has managed to, do, do, uh, to uh, deliver a GDF is the, um, um, the US in New Mexico. It's already half full. They've already had major accidents. They had a truck uh, combust. Down, down under um, when it was delivering stuff. They then, they also had a drum burst. They had been putting in uh, incompatible chemicals in together. The radioactivity did reach the surface um, uh, and so on. And the assumption is that the cleanup from there will cost two billion. But it, basically this geological uh, facility is, it's built on the assumption that over the thousands of years that it has got to sit there, um, that the salt will deform and encase it. It's completely reliant on a geological barrier and the idea that this stuff will stay dry and that it will stay secure in there. Once it's sealed, there's no monitoring, there can be no fixing of any problems. Um, and, well, already, already we have problems. Already there's radioactive contamination coming to the surface. So, 
not looking good to me. Um, Australia to the rescue. They keep, keep talking about it, about Australia digging up its outback and uh, taking the world's waste. Um, there was another report earlier this year that South Australia might take about 13% of the world's waste. But then crazy environmentalists over in Australia sort of saying, why should we? Uh, which I suppose I can get their point. Um, so do we have plans? Well, we do. Um, we, uh, we have a, an organisation that says it's going to find a, GW, uh, um, a GDF. Um, and the idea is that it's done on a voluntary basis, that areas around the country are, basically the local authority is given extra funding and so on to make it, uh, the, the local population compliant. Um, and I love the way they say this with, with such certainty, and they've drawn great diagrams as to how it's going to look. Um, a GDF will be designed using natural geology and engineering so that waste is contained inside these multiple barriers. The trouble is we don't have it. Um, Cumbria has been put forward, but um, the geology there is really not good for a, a waste disposal site that has to stay secure for thousands, tens of thousands of years. Um, the ne most obvious place next, I think, is somewhere around Thetford, but there are problems there too. And we're talking about a big area. Um, and we then have to transport all this stuff to that area. So it's, it's a big issue. So for anybody who thinks, uh, you know, that, the, you know, I think it's something, it's a really serious question. It's a practical consideration. It's a financial consideration. It's a moral consideration. This is something we're going to leave to generations on and on and on. And I would point out Keith Barnum, um, who's a professor of physics, I, I'm just going to borrow what he said because it just makes so much sense to me. As he says, you know, Stonehenge was only built, what, four, four to five thousand years ago. If the people there were trying to communicate something to us about not why we shouldn't dig <laughs> in that area, it's been lost in the mist of time. And I think that makes it, how are we going to communicate with generations, hundreds, thousands of years down the line? How? You know, it, it's just not going to happen, is it? We just leaving them with a problem. Um, so, there we go. I, let's take a, a short break, and if there are any questions there, that's the techie bit over, okay? We'll get more onto the policy in a minute. So. Right, so now the second bit, we, this, this bit we're going to look at um, UK policy and where we are at the moment. And so, um, everyone has heard that term, electricity too cheap to meter, that's what we were all promised with nuclear. And it seems to go back to, in fact, an American who actually said that. But of course, even people like Tony Benn, who was Minister for Technology back in the 60s in the Wilson government, was very pro-nuclear. He believed in the atoms for peace story. He later said it was one of his biggest mistakes. He found that actually the, the program that he was promoting, we were sending plutonium back to the US for, for weaponry, uh, and he really regretted um, having supported the, the, the system. But he was part of the major push for our second uh, generation, the AGRs. Um, so what happened to our nuclear program? Okay, because hey, for a long while it went long, very quiet, didn't it? Um, well, the, the problem started immediately. There was the fire at wind scale, and that was, of course, almost as immediately we kicked off our nuclear program. Uh, and so faltering optimism. Big, big accidents abroad um, didn't help. The AGR program itself was a disaster financially. Um, each, each of the, the, 50, the 14 uh, AGRs came with its own story of leaks and mismanagement and being behind uh, time schedule and overrunning in costs and so on. So each had its uh, particular problems. And of course now we're faced with the, the prospect that the AGRs we've got at the moment, the 14 of them, are going to cost five times as much to decommission as the Magnox plants that we had. Um, and so the last new build was in 1995. And since then, nobody's been interested. Until now, of course. And I think, I mean, I think that it's very... Uh, telling the private sector has not been interested even when our energy consumption was really going up nobody has thought it was worthwhile going ahead with nuclear until more recently even 2003 government white papers said nuclear power is deeply economically unattractive we do not want to go there but 2005 we started thinking about peak oil and and peak everything um, and it sort of came back on the agenda and i don't know if like if you, like, like me, I mean, 
I woke up every morning and listened to the radio and suddenly nuclear was being talked about again as a positive alternative. It was still, it was, it was really quite a turnaround. It was quite a PR a coup, actually. Um, how it suddenly, people were suddenly talking about it positively when it had been <coughs> nothing like that just, just a year or two before. Um, and 2007, apparently we could build nuclear without any subsidies. Well, that was a big turning point. Uh, and Miliband uh, finally gave the go-ahead to the 12 new reactors. But then came Fukushima in Japan, huge disaster, still not cleared up, still you know, rolling on in its own way. I, I haven't followed all the details. But that, that really affected everything. It's affected the finances, it's affected the security issues uh, on, um, on uh, uh, reactors and so on. Um, and then that's really affected the economics of the whole programme. Um, but in 2012, we introduced contracts for difference, which we were discussing last week. Now, that, what that means is, and actually I think the government's been quite clever, I believe actually it was Ed Miliband who initiated these, even though they didn't get uh, really implemented until the coalition government. But the contracts for difference, so what it means is that, for example, with Hinckley, we, the taxpayer, will not be part, we will not be paying for the building, okay? It, the suppliers, the company, they have to find that from the private sector. They are responsible for building it. And technically, there will be penalty, price, penalty costs if they overrun or if they breach any guidelines and so on. But what they have said in return is that if we're going to make this massive investment, we need to know that we are, have a guaranteed electricity price. And at the moment, electricity prices are all over the place. In fact, in general, they're going down in our country. So, um, so what, we have a, what they have agreed is a strike price. And the idea is that, that the difference between what they can sell the electricity for on the wholesale market, um, we will, the government, i.e. we, the taxpayer, will make up to a strike price, a guaranteed strike price for the lifetime of the, of the plant. Um, and as you know, that, that, life, that strike price is pretty high. So there we are, we went ahead with the, with the programme and we also announced upgrades for all our AGRs, each of them costing 600 million. Now I, I don't know, um, I haven't seen any details of the contracts that there were, were set up for those. I mean, I suspect they've been let off things like penalties if they break down. Those issues about the graphite wearing down and so on, they definitely there has been a relaxation of safety standards to enable those AGRs to go ahead, to continue. There's a, a, a huge proportion of graphite loss per year from the statistics I've seen. Um, so um, so that it'd be interesting to know more about that, but as ever, so much of this is kind of shrouded in secrecy. Anyway, so here's our programme. These are the sites, mainly on, on well, in fact, all on existing nuclear sites, but the government wants to go ahead and build these. Now, okay, let's just look at it from the government's point of view and why, why they want this. This is the list of nuclear, of, sorry, of power plants that we are, have closed since 2011. So it's a phenomenal list. And the, the point is that by 2030, we will have closed around two thirds of our major power plants. And this is what is focusing government mind at the moment. So we've closed those plus one or two extras, rugly and, and whatever. We have a commitment now, the government has said, that we will close all our coal-fired power plants by 2025, um, if we can replace them with gas. Uh, but that generally, the feeling is that coal is on its way out. And there's our, uh, th in fact, I've put this slide in because it gives you the original dates on which our AGRs were supposed to be closed. So you can see 2014, 2016, really now, but we've, we've extended it to these dates. So, but the point is that these will all be offline uh, apart from size will be by 2030. So the government is looking at uh, this. And what it's looking at is our capacity in this country is, has been coming down a little. Uh, last year, I think we lost almost three gigawatts in capacity. But what they're worried about is that we're losing, mo it's a reducing proportion that comes from our major power providers. Uh, it's now just over 71 gigawatts. Now, you, if you think about it from a government's point of view, what they want is to know that this is all under their control. They don't have to think of it. There are just a few major providers out there producing our electricity, job done kind of thing. But actually, of course, the whole system is becoming much more heterogeneous than that. Um, 
Um, and what they're worried about in particular is, of course, our peak demand in winter, the, that four to eight o'clock in the evening on a winter's night, when our demand can go up quite substantially. Um, this was just on an October evening, but it can go up till to, well, our peak last year, or the beginning of this year was 52 gigawatts. Yeah, yeah, 52,000 uh, megawatts, which is 52 gigawatts. Um, and last year, of course, we did get to the first stage. We weren't near a blackout, but at the first stage of having to ask industries to power down at, uh, on a November night to make sure that the, we were no, that we still had a sufficient safety margin. So that's the issue we've got at the moment. Is this margin of, of supply over capacity is not looking so secure as it was just a few years ago. And so the government, but the government seems very much at odds in its focus, its policy, to the, the business sector, in fact, the, to the national grid. So the government very much is looking at baseload, and you were talking, hear them talking about how our need for baseload. Um, but interestingly, the CEO of the national grid is saying baseload is outdated. Instead of just looking at increasing supply so that you, me and everybody else can consume what we want, when we want and know that the lights won't go out. We've got to have a much more interactive system, much more demand management, much more, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, load shifting off the peak areas uh, and so on, microgrids, you and me being able to generate electricity at different times of the day and then sell it back to the grid uh, and so on. A much more interactive system. But the, gov the government hasn't quite sort of got this into their heads. So as they see it, uh, the challenge is to replace uh, our coal-fired power plants that are about to go offline and our AGRs that are about to go offline and meet the needs of the growing population. Plus, and this is perhaps the biggest challenge, the electrification of heat and transport. OK, and so of course, nuclear is not going to meet the immediate needs. Even if we built, started on Hinkley tomorrow, it's not going to be, meet that immediate uh, issue about supply over the next 10 years. But what they're thinking is, we do need a massive expansion of our electricity production in about 10 years. And how are we going to get there? That is, if you're asking why our government is pursuing Hinkley and all the rest of it, that is the answer. And just let's be clear in terms of emissions. So if we see on, on a time basis, so here's our oil going down, but fairly consistently, but now going back up because of uh, uh, decreased oil prices. Gas bobbing around on its way down, but much more heat sensitive because so much of it goes towards our heating. Coal on its way down, and that will again be a big drop this year. Um, nuclear bobbing along fairly consistently, and renewables coming up, and again should come up a lot more this year. But when you think, think of it, we have got to get all of that into this. We have to get our gas, coal, our oil for oil reed transport. Um, and if we don't want nuclear, we have to get that into renewables. That is our challenge, OK? That is huge. And just so you know, the Committee of Climate Change, for our, our carbon emissions, we, are, we have the Climate Change Act, and so we have legislated three carbon budgets ahead. We've just now legislated this year for up to 2032, a 57% cut from 1990. And the Committee on Climate Change is very much building into their projections both nuclear and carbon capture and storage. So um, that's very much part of their thinking. And so Hinkley, okay, which we all know about. And the plan for the two, it's going to be 3.2 gigawatts in total, supposedly around 7% of the country's needs. Um, and it's very much based, it's entirely based on this one, Flamanville and France. Flamanville and France and Okiloto in, in, in Finland, they are the only private sector led, although I don't know whether you can call EDF private sector, but they're the only nuclear power plants to be built in Europe in the last 15, 20 years. Um, and both disasters, okay, both financial disasters, uh, not just financial safety disasters, it appears. So both of them, I mean, Flamville was supposed to be online in 2012. Now it'll be 2020 at the earliest, at the earliest. Three times the price that was originally planned. Um, Last year, of course, they failed their stress tests. Um, 
They knew they had a problem, they continued building. We still don't know whether the regulator in France is going to pull the plug on the whole thing or make them strip it out and start again, whatever. So there's all that to go. Um, Okilutu, again, way, way over budget. Um, supposed to be online in 2010, now at the earliest 2018, multi-billion lawsuits going forwards between the French and the, um, and the uh, Finns. So really not good, okay? You know, these are the, supposed to be the two flagship nuclear reactors for Europe um, and neither of them are a success. But hey, our government's not deterred. Um, after the brief pause over summer, uh, when everyone thought, wow, maybe Mrs May will pull the plug on this, um, she didn't. She, we went ahead and signed in, on, in September. Um, and the, oh, the cost has already gone up. I mean, originally it was around 16 billion. Now the estimate is around 25 billion. With that strike price of 92.50, it's very controversial. It's index linked. So it'll be around 279 uh, per megawatt hour by 2058. The normal price at the moment is around 42, 45 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. So that's quite a high return. I think it gives um, investors in EDF a, a guaranteed, uh, should everything go to plan, 10% uh, return for as long as the reactor is operating. Um, there are other costs that come in there for our government. Um, in fact, our audit office has calculated the whole budget, the whole subsidy from us at about 30 billion. Okay, so basically we're paying really, we're going to be paying an inflated electricity price into the, into the future to avoid those upfront costs, to avoid the building costs. Um, and there's a lot of other issues around Hinkley. The point is that, okay, to, Getting that financial package, EDF have said they are going to finance two thirds of it. We'll come on to EDF in a minute. But um, who was going to make up the rest of it? There's been lots of financial shenanigans, Centrica in there and then out again and so on. Um, but the, um, finally the Chinese are in, but there's obviously a deal going on that gives them the right to build a, a Chinese uh, designed reactor at Bradwell and they will have the, the majority stake in that. And they will also have a minority stake in a, a new build at Sizewell. There seems to be no transparency around these contracts. We cannot see, nobody seems able to see exactly what has been agreed with the Chinese. Um, I think for anybody who, who is sceptical about whether Hinkley should go ahead, um, there is some hope in that the concrete will not get poured in Hinkley until Flamanville has started up. OK, um, and that will be probably mid-2019. Flamengo still has to go through its tests and so on. So it may still not happen. There is a possibility that Hinkley may still not happen. We're facing legal challenges on the whole issue about state subsidies uh, and so on from Austria, Luxembourg and, and uh, some companies in Germany. Apparently, we've threatened some awful retaliations to Austria for doing this. I read in the Financial Times. It must be true. But the biggest other threat to the whole programme is EDF. Um, which, and um, just remember, EDF is not just the lead financier and builder of Hinkley. EDF owns all our nuclear power plants. They control all of them. So this is a company we need to be safe, OK? Um, but EDF isn't anything but safe by most people's standards. Um, it's actually been raided by its own French regulators this year to look at the, the paperwork on Hinkley Point. And I, I read this has happened. I don't know any more on it. Um, it's market capitalization. That means its number of shares times the value of its shares uh, was 21 billion at the end of 2015. I'll show you in a minute why it will be much less in a minute when you look at their share price. Their net debt is very high uh, compared to that. And basically, their earnings are down because the electricity prices are low. Um, they have, but they, have, beyond all that, they have responsibilities in France. They, of course, run and maintain all the French nuclear plants. I think there are 58, I think, in France that are all ageing. They all need maintenance and they all are coming up for decommissioning, which is an expensive process. And unlike this country, where our government has assumed a lot of the decommissioning costs, in France, EDF hold all the costs for their decommissioning. 
so, and by law, Hollande, I think, was in, in a coalition government with the, the Greens in France for a, for a while, and they passed a law saying that they had to start cutting their nuclear power, because they are 75% reliant on nuclear, <coughs> unlike us. Um, and so they have to, they, by law, have to decommission between 17 and 25 plants by 2025. That is a phenomenal financial cost to, to EDF. Um, uh, and to extend the plants, the life plant of the other ones in France, uh, estimated cost of 55 billion euro. So when you look at the cost, it doesn't look great. They also have to develop their own geological disposal facility. Um, they have a site earmarked in the northeast of France, but unsurprisingly, the public there don't want it. It's got a lot of protests. Um, and that they've put aside, or well, no, I don't think they've put aside, but that is an estimated cost of about 25 billion euro could be anything, frankly. Um, and they've also been obliged this year to buy out Arriva, which is the design company, uh, the, the reactor design company, which was another sort of state-run company, and it, it sort of went it bankrupt. So EDF was forced by the French government to buy it. So their finances do not look good. And you can see their share price here. <laughs> it has absolutely sunk, um, particularly this year. But of course, the one thing EDF, so EDF Energy that operates in this country is wholly owned by EDF. EDF itself is 85% owned by the French government. And the French, this is the plus side for EDF. Um, the French government has said that they will um, make all necessary uh, measures, take all necessary measures to support the company. And in fact, EDF uh, uh, floated a bond earlier this year for, to raise 4 billion euros, and the French government bought 3 billion of it. So, but they've had credit rating downgrades. That means when, when the credit rating agencies think you are not looking so hot financially, but you're not, your viability is more questionable, they will downgrade you. And that makes your borrowing costs much higher. Uh, and that is the position that EDF is in. Um, and yes, I think one of the questions I've seen raised is if there are overruns, and it is almost inevitable that there will be in building Hinkley, if, they, if it goes ahead, uh, what are the penalties that our government will exact from them? Um, because that would be the normal thing to do, that they would have to pay, pay for not produce, uh, producing the electricity on the, on the, uh, according to the agreed contract. And that could, could really be a killer as well. So there we go. OK, so there's Hinkley. But remember, we also have various other plans for other new nuclear build around the country. Um, Horizon uh, is planning new build at Wilfer and Albury, um, and at New Gen at um, Moorside. Moorside next to Sellafield, OK? And they keep coming up with these wonderful new names. It sounds wonderful, Moorside. It sounds green and pleasant and so on. Um, uh, and interestingly, just last week, I think, or just this week, Kepco, which is a South Korean company, have said they may come in on that. Um, Kepco has also been done with safety data fraud on their nuclear program and so on, just to add into the mix. So, um, so there we are. There are, are those ones to go. But I mean, really, Hinkley is the flagship. Um, and whether these will, these are still all at the sort of planning stage. These are new kinds of reactors that have to be agreed by our uh, nuclear body. They have to agree that they're safe and then they have to go through various planning. So there's several years behind the whole Hinkley process. And just so you know, so the Climate Change Committee that was set up by the Climate Change Act that, as I showed you earlier, is very much saying we need to build in nuclear and CCS if we're going to meet our carbon targets. And of course, we're not on target to meet our targets, our fourth and fifth car uh, carbon budgets. But they have said, mm, think government, you need a B plan. Uh, and actually, even they uh, have admitted that tidal lagoons are a good alternative. Offshore wind may have comparable cost to Hinkley uh, and so on. They're still very keen on CCS and actually small modular nuclear reactors, which we'll come to in a minute. They, they, they're very wedded to nuclear. Um, Right, OK, so I've put in another breather there, just in case anybody had any questions at that point about UK policy and about Hinkley. OK, so we'll just sort of really get back to that original question, OK, about, uh, so is, uh, is uh, nuclear affordable? Is it cheap? 
Is it clean? Is it low carbon? Is it price competitive? And particularly, is there an opportunity cost um, with every investment? Um, and is it safe? And it, with that comes cyber security, of course, is a, a sort of new thought on the block. Okay, so one of the questions, so in terms of security of supply, this has often been flagged up. Do we have enough uranium? Okay, and interestingly, I looked at the um, World Nuclear Association site, and this is, these are the latest figures available for our uranium supplies around the world, and they're from 2009, so quite out of date. And quite interestingly, the uh, purple line is what's available at a price of up to around $80 per kilo. Uh, and the yellow, if it goes over that, to up to $130 per kilo. The trouble is that the price is now about $23 a kilo. So the uranium price, we have a glut of uranium at the moment. Um, and that's largely because of Fukushima. Um, so we only have only three Japanese plants have restarted since the Fukushima disaster. Germany, have come, of course, is scaling down, going to be nuclear free by 2022. The US now is beginning to cut its nuclear, uh, and, and they have been the biggest consumers of nuclear power. Um, this one, in fact, was just this week, I think, the Diablo plant in, Kenya, in uh, California said that they're going to close. Uh, and although that may be to do with costs and gas competing, I think it's also to do partly with the, the tsunami risk there. You can see that from one of the maps. Right next to the San Andreas Fault. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, there is always that risk of a, a little earthquake in California, which is so long overdue. So, um, so we have a, so basically, the, the picture on whether how much uranium we have is complicated. Because of those issues about concentrations in the ore, you need a fairly high price to get to a lot of that uranium. And adding to the complication, we have an awful lot of interest in nuclear all of a sudden. So and the maiden drivers here are particular chi particularly <coughs> China. I don't know if you can see along that line and read down. So China at the moment has about 25 operating plants. But um, have I got that right? 20, 20, 26, yes. And then 25 under construction, 43 planned, and 136 proposed. OK, so they are planning a massive expansion of nuclear. And just to, obviously this table is very long. It goes on for all the uh, countries. So I put this one in because it gives you the, the world total here. Um, you can see, in fact, I put the figures at the top. At the moment, we have 436 nuclear plants around the world operating, but another 67 under construction, 155 planned and 322 pr proposed. Now, if all those come off, there's going to be quite an increased demand for uranium. Um, but um, so the question is again, do we have enough? The calculations I've seen are that at the current price and the current level of consumption, we probably have enough for about 80 years. But if everybody cranked up, if all those uh, power plants are built and so on, the amount we have reduces drastically. Um, Added to that, we also need various exotic metals for the containment uh, vessels, uh, and we also need graphite, which we uh, use also in lithium-ion batteries. Um, and so there is a potential shortage of those uh, as well. Just to add there, just to complicate the whole issue further, there's an awful lot of more new research going into new kinds of reactors. Bill Gates is putting his money into travelling wave reactors, which need some enriched uranium to get going, but uh, apparently then use a lot of uh, depleted uranium. There are other types, molten salt, high temperature, whatever, all sorts of different kinds. And then there's the possibility of going back to thorium, which we ignored right at the beginning. There's a massive research plant at Halden in Norway, looking at Norway. Fusion now has pretty much gone off the block, I think. Even the proponents of it um, have been real champions of it for many years have finally sort of, from what I've seen, said, right, okay, this probably isn't going to happen. But there's an awful lot of new, uh, looking at new ways, new, new fission uh, reactors. Um, and in this country, of course, our government is also very keen on these small modular reactors, usually around 300 megawatts each. Westinghouse are the main lead uh, company uh, looking at uh, doing the research into these. Um, 
And the idea is that they'll be dotted around the country. We get away from the big plants and we have small reactors which can be assembled. They'll be cheaper. This is the idea that they'll be basically uh, manufactured in a... It, it's a bit like flat pack, OK? It's manufactured in a centre place. You take it out to the site, you put it together and whoopee, you've got a, a, a nuclear reactor. So there's the, all that going on. So again, do we have enough uranium? We've got all these different things, price going down, which will probably, which will inevitably lead to withdrawal of investment from mining, uh, therefore price going up again. But then we've got the whole issue about demand being in a state of flux uh, and so on, but possibly increasing greatly. Um, and so in general, the conclusion is it looks unlikely that we have enough uranium in the world for all countries who potentially want it um, and worse that we're going to have to start sourcing it from rocks where it is in a very very low concentration I mean a hundred parts per million is very very low um, and it is possible that we will be um, that, that when we get to that level it really will be using as much energy to get the damn stuff out as we are uh, going to get power from it and it's very likely that uranium will become much more expensive um, so let's look at that question about, is nuclear low carbon? Um, these are all very interrelated questions. Our Committee of Climate Change has said that all new power generation from 2030 should be less than 50 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. We're currently at around 500 grams. So we've got a long way to go to, to meet that target. So what does nuclear come in at? Well, there are huge variations in the assessment of whether nuclear is clean or not. And it is uh, how many grams of carbon it, it produces per kilowatt hours. It really de does depend on how you do the accounting. Estimates range from about 3 to 220. And the government comes in on a very low 6. Okay, That's their assessment of how clean uh, uh, nuclear is. Um, Keith Barnum, who is the um, professor of physics at Imperial, he's reviewed, I mean, I, you know, he has reviewed eight of the most rigorous life cycle analysis uh, reports. And he found that uh, there were about four came in above the 50 gram target and four about, about below. So it's quite contestable. There are other very good, and if anybody wants them, I'm happy to send them uh, the links, uh, other very good researchers who've concurred around sort of 66 grams, so somewhat above the target aim, um, but, uh, but not horrendously so. But of course, the, but the big issue is the emissions, how clean nuclear fuel is depends on that source and how much rock you have to drill through to get it. Um, uh, at 0.01% emissions are as high as gas fired. Um, and the energy required may be equal to or more than the energy, energy generated over the lifetime. So, but 37% of our uranium ore is already very close to that level. Okay? Um, and the assumption is at that, the level of demand that's projected, we will be down to mining the lowest level, 0.005%, uh, which really does not make economic sense at all. Uh, this is one particular researcher. Um, he's an independent consultant. He, he uh, you know, reports to the EU uh, and to our government and so on. Um, and his, his conclusion is he comes in at 66. And he's put in a very helpful comparison, which is really what we need. So solar, actually, and wind and biomass come in at a much lower uh, grams per carbon dioxide equivalent than nuclear. So, you know, that's the big thing. And then when you compare it, of course, to gas or fuel cell, diesel and so on, it's actually, um, you know, those are really, really uh, not uh, fuel sources that we want to consider in the future. And I think there's another way at look, of looking at the whole emissions issue. It is the, you know, it's the opportunity cost. When you look at the costs of nuclear, the money involved in it, every billion pounds we spend on nuclear is a billion pounds we don't spend on something else um, and I think that, that you know it's you just can't ignore this nuclear is not cheap um, and the costs are escalating so dramatically that's the trouble 
So in 2002, white paper estimated our costs of waste management and so on at 48 billion. Now that's what we have now, that's without new development, that's without Hinkley and the whole new raft of, of, uh, of nuclear power plants. By 2008, that increased to 78.9, now 110 billion, talk of 162 billion. Uh, We've already paid a chunk of this. The National Audit Committee, oh sorry, I've put this one in. The National Audit um, Committee points out that nuclear is already more expensive than wind and solar. Okay, so, it, it, you know, yeah, why, why are we doing it? Why would we go there? Um, the Intergenerational Foundation, I mean, just look it up on the website. Um, they, um, they have pointed out that our uh, new reactor programme is calculated to cost 31.2 billion more than the equivalent of onshore wind and almost 40 billion more than the equivalent amount of power from solar. Uh, there are other costs that go with nuclear. There's so many hidden costs there. Um, the research and fission and fusion uh, column and, and other plants that we're, we're financing. The GDF, the Global Disposal Facility, 12, uh, the geological disposal facility, 12 billion, but that's just an estimate. Who knows? We don't even know where it's going to be yet, and we don't know when it's going to be built. Um, you know, there's almost no control over these costs. Civil nuclear police, 100 million a year. We have a special um, nuclear police. And I don't think we can ignore this either. Nuclear comes with some very costly, what we call black swan events, the things you just can't model. Uh, you can't plan for a nuclear accident you can't plan for a cyber attack and that's becoming a much more critical thing uh, that we're looking at um, you know because so many industries are now you know even in the last week or two of news we've seen it are, are under attack uh, uh, in terms of their digital systems uh, and so on air attacks thefts of nuclear material happen around the world uh, and so on um, and just look, I mean, to me, one of the most overwhelmingly depressing things looking at nuclear is how badly managed has this been since we started this program? I mean, when did we think for so many decades it would be safe? How did we think it would be safe to just stick stuff in a shaft? you know, radioactive materials and forget about them and leave them to another generation? I think there is a question, do we have the maturity, you know, to deal with nuclear. We have this phenomenal power source, but we haven't done it very well so far. We haven't, we haven't managed it well. Look at Sellafield. It's a complete mess. And it's something that you and I and our children and our grandchildren and so on are going to have to live with. Um, you know, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good window uh, frontage for the idea of new nuclear. I mean, do, are we sure that this is going to be better managed in the future? So, so back to the, 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 so the question, okay, but can we live without this nuclear power? This is the big question. We've, we had tight margins at the moment, although this winter is supposed to be the worst. Um, after this, we have more interconnectors coming on stream. We've got more nuclear, uh, more um, renewable capacity uh, booked, another, I think, six gigawatts before 2021, uh, and so on. But we, we certainly do face a tightish margin, which we're getting round, but with capacity payments, we've paid, we're paying coal to stay in the background, uh, ready to, to steam up as necessary. Um, and hopefully that won't be needed for many more winters. But we'll get around it at the moment. The bigger question is that issue about how are we going to scale up our energy, product, uh, energy production in, you know, as you and I start driving our electric cars and start switching from gas boilers to electric heating. Um, I would just say, I mean, there is one very, one report that looked very specifically at this, which was Dr. Daniel Quiggins' report a couple of years ago for Greenpeace. And they, Greenpeace set him, being very anti-nuclear, they set him a very tight task, him and his team, a uh, very tight task. Was it possible to cut all our coal, all our nuclear, electrify 25% of our heating and put 12.7 million electric cars on the road by 2030? Uh, and his conclusion was that it is possible. 
we can do it. Um, we have to use a lot of new technologies, you know, air, ground source, pumps, wind, uh, you know, stuff like that. But the major issue is we have to reduce demand, and that is the only way that we would do that. He did say we will still have to be using some gas. And that's the whole issue with the, with the um, that's the projection, with that, the, the movement away from baseload uh, is that we use our m heterogeneous uh, sources of renewables and use gas as a peak backup. Uh, because gas can be, can I come back to you in a second, is that right? Uh, because gas can be fired up very quickly and the new turbines can be fired up within half an hour. Um, and so that we use that to meet when we have a sudden peak demand uh, and so on. And I put a picture of, kettle, of a kettle on there because I remember I went to hear Dr. Daniel Quinn speak about this. And his point was, and this was only true a couple of years ago, it certainly wouldn't be true now, but his point was all the solar that we had in 2014 was generating enough the equivalent for all the undrunk cups of tea we had, all the overboiled kettles that we then didn't use. So when you think about all the kettles that you fill up and then you don't fully use uh, or whatever, um, that was his point. You know, really, and, and anybody who's there in the energy field looking at this will tell you the big issue is how we cut our waste, our wasteful use, uh, and uh, become so much more efficient, which is what we need to do. So, it is possible to do without nuclear, but it is a whopping great challenge. And it's up to us, of course, to decide whether we do that. Um, I think it's very unlikely that Hinkley is going to manage to go ahead. Um, but uh, in which case, we have got to think about that B plan, as the Committee of Climate Change said. Um, but there we go. Anyway, this talk was sponsored by the Energy Co-op and thank you very much to them. And thank you for Solar Aid. Thank you very much.